the beaches of Samoa and the pastures of New Zealand and the ranches of Australia. They're so much like uh, the American West that we love. We've been to the rice paddies of Vietnam and the Philippines and Thailand, the hills of Korea, the forests of Malaysia, and now we've seen the snow in the mountains of Alaska. before midnight on a rainy November 1st, President Lyndon Johnson landed at Elmendorf Air Force Base in Anchorage, Alaska. He was on American soil for the first time in 17 days. His 28,000-mile odyssey through Southeast Asia was over. The Manila Conference was history, and the American commitment to the non-communist nations of the Pacific had been fully underscored. Perhaps the real impact of the presidential mission would not be properly gauged for months or even years, but one thing was already clear. At Manila, the United States had formally declared its willingness to guarantee the security of the Western Pacific and to help the people of that area in the development of a new regional cooperation. For contemporary historians, this was a new and major benchmark in American foreign policy. That partnership will endure just as long as the leaders who met at Manila, wanted to, and who work and try to make it to. And I think it will endure long after those of us who met there have passed from the scene. And now we are coming to the end of our journey. We're winding our way back to Washington. It has been the most rewarding and the most thrilling and the most encouraging journey of my entire life. I believe it may also have been the most important and the most historic. Certainly not done. The war in Vietnam is not over. Great obstacles must be overcome before progress is built into the life of Asia and the Pacific, and before the region organizes itself thoroughly on a cooperative basis. But everywhere we went, I met strong men who have put their shoulder to the wheel and their hands to the task. I saw leaders who know that in this era, the ultimate success of political power lies with the people. Everywhere, the drumbeat of equality can be heard. And the leaders of modern Asia are getting in step with it rather fast. During the 17-day journey, the members of the White House press corps who had traveled with him had shared in and sensed the excitement and the almost desperate eagerness among the people of a vast region to bring a new order and stability into their own lives. On the morning of November 3rd, with the president back and already busy in the White House, the question uppermost in minds of the newsmen concerned the off-year elections. For more than a week, many reporters in and outside of the White House had been speculating about the president's probable campaign role during the final days before November the 8th. The answer to their speculations came at a 3.30 news conference in the cabinet room. I wanted you to know that my doctors have recommended that I undergo surgery to repair a defect at the site of the incision made during the gallbladder operation a year ago. After final discussions with Dr. Berkeley in Seoul, Korea on Tuesday, I accepted his recommendation that the operation take place within a period of 15, 18 days from now. 
The doctors also intend at that time to remove a small polyp from my throat. They have recommended that I begin a reduced schedule of activity in preparation for the operation. And I intend to leave tomorrow for Texas. The small polyp in the president's throat had caused a hoarseness that had become noticeable during the August campaign swing through upstate New York. It had cleared up from time to time, but had occurred again just before the Asian trip. Although the tissue would be tested after the operation, the chance that the growth was cancerous seemed remote. The recurrence of the difficulty associated with the gallbladder operation was a matter of averages on which the president had been unlucky. But the operation itself was not an uncommon one. Given his durable physique, it appeared that the president would confront the ordeal with every prospect of a normal and speedy recovery. The Asian tour had been a triumph of the qualities most predominant in his nature, drive, stamina, and the constant desire to meet people face to face. If he had felt any personal indisposition or physical pain, it hadn't kept him from fulfilling every commitment of his two and a half week journey. He had yielded to the demands of his surgeons only when the mission had been completed. And now that he had yielded, he was paying the full price of the presidency. The questions about his health were incessant and inevitable, as were the wry and cynical comments by some of his critics that perhaps the surgery was being scheduled with an eye more to partisan than to medical considerations. He took it in stride, held a nationally televised news conference the following afternoon, introduced five new members of the White House family to the press, and then left for the Texas White House. On the morning of November 5th, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara arrived at the LBJ ranch to continue discussions with President Johnson on the defense budget for fiscal 1968 and to offer some brand new equations on the war in Vietnam. Whereas the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong forces were approaching possible victory some 15 months ago, I think it's clear to all that today a military victory is beyond their grasp. One year ago, we were in the midst of a very rapid troop expansion in South Vietnam. Today, a slowdown in our rate of troop deployment to that country is planned. Although the United States would continue its increased military operations in South Vietnam in 1967, lower draft calls would be made over the next four-month period, beginning in December. The number of air attacks per month during the coming year, barring any emergencies, would remain at their present level. This trend toward a stabilization in the war reflected a military situation in which it was now clear that the Viet Cong and their North Vietnamese allies could no longer achieve a military victory. The problem now was to demonstrate our staying power while searching for a path to the conference table. Outwardly, President Johnson seemed to be maintaining his posture as a preoperative patient, seeking rest and relaxation in the atmosphere of his ranch. At first glance, even his office seemed quiet, giving little indication of the schedule he had already set for himself prior to his operation. We will be uh, processing uh, something like a thousand bills in the next few days, and we do want to get through with the, the examination of these measures and take action on them as soon as we can. I'm expecting Mr. Comer, my special assistant in connection with Vietnam, to arrive uh, late today or early tomorrow morning. At my request, Secretary Gardner has submitted to me some very far-reaching proposals for major reorganizations of the
the Health, Education, and Welfare Department. I expect Ambassador Goldberg to arrive at the ranch sometime before I leave for San Antonio tomorrow. I uh, hope to have some extended discussions with him, and perhaps uh, maybe he'll fly on in San Antonio with me. On the morning of November 7th, President Johnson and United Nations Ambassador Arthur Goldberg left the LBJ Ranch on a trip to Cotula, Texas to honor National Education Week. Their second stop of the day would be Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, where the chief executive would undergo a preoperative physical examination. On the first leg of their journey, they talked about Vietnam. This country's search for peace within the framework of the United Nations had elicited some new signals Faint and indirect as they were, they had come from countries previously no less rigid in their posture than Hanoi. Since it was obvious that the countries involved seemed anxious to join in the search for peace, President Johnson asked Ambassador Goldberg to respond to these new signals, using any appropriate channel or personal visit that might affect the prospects for a possible settlement. In 1928, Lyndon Johnson was a young man working his way through San Marcos Teachers College. Because of finances and the desire to get on with what he thought would be his life's vocation, he had begun his teaching career before graduation in the small Mexican-American community of Catula. And in that year, I think I learned far more than I taught. And the greatest lesson was this one. Nothing, nothing at all matters more than trained intelligence. It is the key not only to success in life, but it is the key to meaning in life. To quit school today before you go as far as you can means to aim a loaded pistol at your life. Shortly before 3 p.m., the president arrived at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio. I'm not in any pain or uh, serious nature, but it's something I want to get over with. And as long as you have a kind of a curtain hanging over you and not knowing what's in your throat or what's going to be the result of it, the best way to do it is just hit the cold water. And that's what I want to do as soon as the doctors will let me. Physically, he was in good condition. The hospital x-rays had proved negative, and his blood pressure and electrocardiogram were normal. Now the decision on when and where was up to the doctors. At 7.21 a.m. on November 8, President and Mrs. Johnson drove in from the ranch to the Pertinales Electric Co-op building in Johnson City to vote. Since his return from Asia on the previous Thursday, President Johnson had conducted a continuous dialogue with the press on Vietnam, inflation, white backlash, and the achievements of the 89th Congress. He had signed a multitude of bills into law and shuttled politicians, diplomats, and cabinet officers in and out of Texas with all of the precision of commuters catching the 805. He managed to make his every move felt in the majority of political constituencies in the country and all of this without making one formal political speech or barnstorming tour. As one prominent news analyst put it later, all in all, it was quite a performance. By early evening, the trend of the elections was clear. 
the Republicans would score a gain of close to 47 seats in the House, three in the Senate, and pick up seven or eight governorships. Although there would be many theories about the voting trend, it was obvious that the American public had reverted to the historical rhythm that so often dictates victory for the out party in the off-year elections. I'd be less than frank if I didn't tell you that I'm sorry we lost any uh, Democratic seats. But I would also tell you that over a period of years, it's, uh, the American people have a way, I guess, of balancing things. But we will have new recommendations, and we will uh, be briefing the members of Congress on them uh, uh, from time to time. And I don't anticipate that we're going to have any great trouble. Uh, 65 majority in the House, 30 uh, a majority in the Senate is a reasonable working majority. Although he was anxious to get on with his operation, it was obvious by Friday morning that the president would be spending the weekend at the ranch. His first guest was Ambassador at Large, Averill Harriman. Following the Manila conference, which he had attended with the president, Ambassador Harriman had made a flying tour of 11 Pacific areas and European countries. At each stop, he told the heads of government about the success of the exchange at Manila and he had encouraged each leader to make recommendations or suggestions that they thought might lead to the conference table in Vietnam. Each one of the countries uh, wants to see peace, a peaceful settlement. In almost every case, they recognize the need to stop aggression. The president has said, and I found it confirmed everywhere, that uh, every country in the world, with the exception of the Red China and Hanoi, want to see peace. And that consensus of opinion, the pressure of world opinion, I think has, gives us a right to have some encouragement. On Sunday morning, the 13th, the first family attended church services in Fredericksburg. A full complement of reporters and news cameramen stood outside waiting and talking about the press conference that had been called for 1015 at the Fredericksburg Municipal Center. Most of them felt sure that the operation schedule had now been firmed up and that surgery would take place early in the coming week. The only other question on their minds was where. We plan to go into Bethesda Naval Hospital uh, Tuesday afternoon spend uh, the afternoon and evening there, and we'll undergo surgery early Wednesday morning. I have talked to the vice president, and as you know uh, from last October, the agreement that was uh, in existence between President Kennedy and myself, and President Eisenhower, and Vice President Nixon uh, will be in effect during that period. We will leave San Antonio tomorrow morning uh, mid-morning, 9, 10 o'clock. We expect that uh, we'll be in the hospital for a very few days and then we'll be returning to Texas. I'm hopeful that I can spend a good portion of my time on the budget between now and the first of the year in the State of the Union message. And except for some time in December uh, when we have some previous engagements in Washington, we'll spend a good deal of our time here. Well, I wish I didn't have to do it. I feel fine. I think that the uh, operations are relatively minor. I think you uh, never uh, want to go to a hospital for any reason, but under the circumstances, uh, I can be very pleased that they are such as they are. They have good doctors, good hospital, good staff, good people around me. I think the circumstances are about as well as they could be. President Johnson entered Bethesda Naval Hospital just before 7 p.m. on the evening of November 15th. The surgery was begun at 6.27 a.m. the following morning. At 7.20, Press Secretary Bill Moyers was able to call Vice President Hubert Humphrey. The dual operation had been successful, and the President was already on the way to his room. The throat polyp, which had been removed 17 minutes after surgery had begun, had already been pronounced benign. 
By 734, President Johnson was conscious and responding to instructions from his doctors. 20 minutes later, he signaled for a pad and pencil and wrote, tell me something, tell me all that took place. By 8 o'clock the next morning, President Johnson was up and about playing host to former President Dwight D. Eisenhower. The two men talked for nearly an hour about the course of the war in Vietnam, and President Johnson renewed his long-standing wish that the former chief executive consider going on a goodwill mission to Asia and other parts of the world during the coming spring. After a long afternoon nap, the president capped his second full day in the hospital with a surprise 32nd wedding anniversary party for Lady Bird. Among the special guests were Vice President and Mrs. Hubert Humphrey. By Friday, it was obvious to his doctors that the chief executive was well on the road to recovery. Despite the fact that his voice was hardly above a whisper, he had still managed to spend a number of his post-operative hours talking to cabinet officers, agency heads, and reporters about the barrage of work that still had to be done before the first of the year. He'd also found time to say his special hellos to a small friend, to listen to a battery of television newscasts throughout each day, and talk wistfully about home and the benefits of some Texas sunshine. Just before noon on Friday the 19th, the doctors gave him his wish. He was pronounced physically fit and able to travel. By 1237, his Washington calendar had been cleared through the rest of November, and he was on his way home. Wednesday the 23rd. Despite some physical discomfort earlier in the week, he acted as the solo welcoming committee at the LBJ Ranch for Secretary of State Dean Rusk, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, Presidential Assistant Walter Rostow, and John McCloy, United States Representative to the NATO Tripartite Talks. On the planned agenda were discussions on Vietnam, and an examination of United States military and political posture in NATO prior to the resumption of the trilateral talks with West Germany and Britain on the 28th of the month. While President Johnson was still in conference with his first four guests of the day, James Webb and a party of several top officials from NASA along with astronauts Edwin Aldrin and James Lovell and their wives, arrived from the Houston Space Center to accept the congratulations of the president on the completion of the Gemini program. In 10 Gemini flights, the United States had acquired 1,940 man hours of pace-setting flight experience. 10 times in a period of over 20 months, two-man teams had gone in orbit around the Earth. Each time, they had been brought home safely. The final flight, which had begun on the morning of November 15th, was the culmination of a team effort that stretched back to 1961 and directly involved more than 25,000 people in government, industry, and university research centers. The splendid performance of man and machine in Germany has been a product of the American system at its best. We are especially proud that our program has been carried out openly. Millions of people around the world have watched on television as the Titan rockets took the Gemini astronauts skyward. The months ahead will not be easy as we reach toward the moon. But with Gemini as the forerunner, we will overcome the difficulties and we will achieve another success. 
As a culmination to the day's ceremonies, astronauts Aldrin and Lovell made a presentation of their own, an aerial view of the LBJ ranch taken from 160 miles out in space. On Friday, November 25th, with a restful Thanksgiving day behind him, President Johnson went back to work with a vengeance. To ease the pull in his mending side, he took to the ranch runway for exercise and a day in the sun. At noon, the President and Mrs. Johnson and House Appropriations Committee Chairman George Mahon welcomed an early contingent of legislative leaders to the first congressional bipartisan session to ever be held at the LBJ Ranch. Among the arrivals were House Majority Leader Carl Albert, House Majority Whip Hale Boggs, and House Minority Leader Gerald Ford. With the arrival of Vice President and Mrs. Humphrey, Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield, and the President's friendly adversary, Senate Minority Leader Everett Dirksen, the formal session was all but underway. Although the leadership delved into the military and diplomatic situation in Vietnam and held a short general discussion on the legislative outlook for the coming year, the heart of the discussion concerned the budget. Over a five and a half year period, the country's economic growth had brought an abundance far beyond any record or any expectation. But there were pressures which now burdened continued growth. Inflation was the cruelest and most capricious burden of all. On January 19, 1966, President Johnson had recommended a special program to take several billion dollars out of the economy through a series of revenue measures. In March, Congress had responded by enacting his proposals. On September 8th, he had outlined a further program to fight inflation. Within six weeks, Congress had again responded, this time with a suspension of the 7% investment tax credit and the use of accelerated depreciation on new buildings. Now in November, the President sought help again. This time, he asked the congressional leaders to postpone, withhold, or defer any of the less essential items in federal programs for the rest of the fiscal year. He felt that if a good-sized reduction could be achieved, it would be another positive step in preserving the country's prosperity. It's not a matter of personal support to me or individual support. If it were, I'm sure I'd have it more than I do, because we've been good friends through the years, but question of what best serves the nation. Men differ about that sometimes. The purpose of this meeting is to try to bring those differences to a minimum and to get their suggestions before decisions were made. By November 29th, after analyzing the last of over 1,000 appropriations bills, President Johnson ordered a fiscal 1967 budgetary cutback of $5.3 billion in federal programs. With this reduction, he hoped to achieve a $3 billion cut in federal spending for the current fiscal year. Now, with the month almost over, the ordeal of surgery and the Manila Conference and the results of the off-year elections behind him, President Johnson turned his attention to December. In the coming 30 days, he faced the problems of a possible tax increase, a bombing pause in Vietnam during the Christmas holidays, the preparation of the State of the Union message, the economic report, and the budget message for fiscal 1968. More than any other state document, the budget message would translate rhetoric into reality, assigning priorities and price tags to the president's visions. One of the certain price tags was the war in Vietnam. As a conflict, it was already costing close to $2 billion a month, and on the surface, it looked as if much of the future cost was already untouchable. Heading toward the new year, 
and with relatively little room to maneuver, President Johnson began making preparations to sustain the domestic goals of his great society.